Let me uh, give you a couple quick examples of the skunk work rules because this is what we ought to apply across the whole culture. I mean, to the federal government, to state governments, to private business, to universities. First, the skunk works manager must be delegated practically complete control of his program in all aspects. Complete control. Second, strong but small project offices must be provided by both the military and industry. Third, the number of people having any connection with the project must be restricted in an almost vicious manner. Use a small number of good people. 10% to 25% compared to the so-called normal system. Now, just me think about that. This guy's saying, you take whatever a normal college administration is, cut it, by t cut it to 10 to 25%. Take a normal government bureaucracy, cut it to no more than 10 to 25%. A very simple drawing and release system with great flexibility for making changes must be provided. There must be a minimum number of reports required but important work must be recorded thoroughly. There must be a monthly cost review covering not only what has been spent and committed, but also projected cost to the conclusion of the program. Don't have the books 90 days late, and don't surprise the customers with sudden overruns. The contractor must be delegated and must assume more than normal responsibility to get good vendor bids or subcontract on the project. Commercial bid procedures are very often better than military ones. This is, we could save, I believe, 20 to 40 percent of the Pentagon just by applying the skunk work rules to military procurement across the board. Uh, 20 to 40 percent on big projects. Uh, the inspection system uh, push more basic inspection responsibility back to subcontractors and vendors. Don't duplicate so much inspection. The contractor must be delegated the authority to test his final product in flight. He can and must test it in the initial stages. If he doesn't, he rapidly loses his competency to design the vehicles. Johnson required that he fly the aircraft so that he would have the feeling. Uh, you go through the whole thing. Funding a program must be timely so that the contractor doesn't have to keep running to the bank to support government projects. There must be mutual trust between the military project organization and the contractor with very close cooperation and liaison on a day-to-day -day basis. This cuts down misunderstanding and correspondence to an absolute minimum. Access by outsiders to the project and its personnel must be strictly controlled. And because only a few people will be used in engineering in most other areas, Ways must be provided to reward good performance by pay, not based on the number of personnel supervised. So there's not an incentive to have more people under you so you get a higher salary. You get a higher salary for doing the job. Very different model from most modern bureaucracies. This is what Tom Peters in The Heart and Soul of Excellence said about Kelly Johnson. Kelly Johnson was responsible for about one-third of what flies in the sky today right after World War II. He developed the first of the military jets, the F-80. Subsequently, he developed the F-104, the C-130, the U-2, the SR-71, to name only a few. At one time, Kelly took an ailing satellite program, which was behind schedule by three years and 700% over budget. It had in just one part of the program 1,271 inspectors. For all this, its successful launch rate was 12.5%. Johnson reduced the number of inspectors from 1,271 to 35. Getting the project back on schedule, uh, got the project back on schedule, began operating below budget, and increased the successful launch rate from 12.5% to 98%. At one point, the Air Force sent a team to consult with Kelly as they were working on a project which was equal in magnitude and complexity to a project he was working on. The Air Force was four years behind schedule, 700% above budget, and had 3,750 people working on it. Kelly Johnson's budget project was on schedule, slightly under budget, and had 126 people working on it. Just think about that number, 3750 to 126. F uh, the, uh, the name Skunk Works uh, was taken from the Little Abner uh, comic strip and refers to a half-licit, half-illicit innovative activity operating on the periphery of an organization. I think the Skunk Works was actually a, a still, wasn't it, in Little Abner? Um, the point is that, that there is a style here. There's a way, it's not just that Johnson's an individual genius. It's a way of cutting through the baloney, eliminating the layers of bureaucracy, focusing responsibility, hiring a very few people who are very good and letting them do the job, and then holding them accountable for how they function so that they invest themselves in getting the job done. So this is part of why I think you can really think about a dramatically smaller system, is because when you look at what really works, it's very small. It's not some huge, complicated bureaucracy. It's a very flat hierarchy with relatively few people. Now, 
What you have to ask yourself about the future is, how much has changed and how much will change? And this is part of the point of Toffler's concept of the third wave of change. Because the truth is, if you look at how much has changed in the 20th century, it's amazing. And if you could go back to 1900 and show them a hologram and a videotape in color of everything that will happen in the 20th century, they'd be astonished. Well, guess what? More is going to happen in the next century. Change is accelerating. It's not, it's not even staying f level. It is accelerating. What? Oh, there's no question. Change is accelerating. I mean, whether or not it accelerates in the U.S. is, I mean, the, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Germans, the Brazilians, the Indians, the second largest center of software in the world is Madras, India. Change is coming. The only question is whether or not America is going to be part of it. But the changes are coming. Now, in that framework, I would suggest to you that every citizen must know the basics of science and technology. And one of the things we have to have, I think, in, in our generation is both a reestablishment, a reassertion of what the minimums are that you need to know about science and technology to be functional. And I think we need to say that we are committed to uh, going back and, in a sense, retrofitting adults. I mean, how do we make it possible for adults to learn the basics if they didn't get it during school? This idea that we'll now teach this generation second graders and 40 years from now we'll get there is nonsense. We've got to find a way to make it relatively easy and relatively accessible for every citizen to learn things. In addition, we've got to change the game so that every citizen learns to be problem solving, solution oriented, persistent, and strategically optimistic. Now, I, I say strategically optimistic for a second because I don't, I don't think you have to get up in the morning and go, wow, everything will work well. But you get up in the morning and you say, if the tire's flat, I'll fix it. If the car's not working, I'll fix it. If I haven't quite solved, you know, if I'm losing hearing, I'll learn how to adjust or I'll get a hearing aid. I mean, the, the whole notion that when you're faced with a problem, your first reaction is to start hunting for the solution is very different than the current system where your first reaction is to relax and feel like you're a victim. A very different model. And, and, I, I, and I talked about specific skills here. Problem solving. You got to start, you gotta, these, these are habits. You practice solving problems. You learn how to do it. Automatically being solution oriented, which by the way means you have to be persistent because the truth is it's hard. I mean, every time we say to people, well, we can give you an easy solution, we actually weaken them. 